On the panel, Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council President Karen Kerrigan joins us this hour. From the New York Post, columnist Michael Goodwin is here, market watcher David Bonson as well. Welcome to all three of you. Some businesses are worried, some consumers still feel pretty good. What's really going on, David? Well, I sent a loving note back to the president after his tweet when we first sat down here saying that the news media didn't uh, pass corporate tax reform, which helped the economy a lot. He did. But the news media also didn't start this trade war, which is now starting to hurt the economy. He did. So the reality is there's a little bit of both sides there. He deserves credit where he deserves credit. Right. But in this particular case, uh, the consumer is not feeling it yet, and the consumer is a lagging indicator. And I always say, there are only two times that the consumer will spend money, when they have money in their checking account and when they don't. The consumer is not a problem. The businesses right now are clearly seeing a decline in confidence. Manufacturing orders have dropped. Durable goods have dropped. And I think that small business optimism that the president drove so successfully the first 18 months of his administration is under threat from the trade war. Now, look at the productivity numbers that came out you know, as well. We haven't seen back-to-back -back numbers this strong since before no, the recession. No, I know. That's why I think the productivity number, right? though, again, it was a second quarter number, and it's a lagging indicator. The issue, productivity comes out of business investment. Business investment comes out of business confidence. So if business investment is fall, you know, if that's where we're struggling, then what's the next step? The productivity that's will drop. It's yes, inevitable. Absolutely. And that's yeah. what we have to be concerned and about. And the timing of that, I mean, it's anybody's guess, I guess. That's, that's right. But I, I think you're feeling it now, right. and I think it can accelerate into the later part of this year. And the timing is always the political uh, argument, too, about how it affects re-election. But go ahead, Michael. Well, well I was just going to say that, look, uh, I, I take David's point that the, this is the president's trade war. But let's rewind and remember why we got into this in the first place. It was this decades of China uh, literally stealing information, t taking jobs away, bad trade deals. I mean, these were these are things now that Bernie Sanders agrees with. Yeah. They, they, Everybody's they, talking about methods versus, you know, well, even if you agree but, on that. But the fact is, China does not abide by the WTO rulings. It, you, you can go to court, you can win these things. It has no impact on China. I mean, they are really a rogue nation when it comes to these international agreements. And so, but this, I think you're exactly right, Michael, but this is the problem. The president said a trade war is easy to win. Right. The president and said we're making a ton of money off of this. Right, China's paying. So, so this is where I happen to agree that China was a bad actor, needed to be dealt with. But the problem with the president's uh, style about it is it set an expectation that this is not supposed to be happening. But I do think your question about the timing yeah, of the economy and the political implication, we get something in our country that answers it for us politically. I wrote an article at National Review over the last hundred years. It's the stock market. The stock market tells you politically how the candidate's being perceived about economic behavior. Because the recession may not come till later, but if it's starting to be felt sooner, that's the key. It isn't enough for the economy to still hold up. The unemployment number could still be really low. Right. But people have to feel like the economy well, is yeah, good. Well, yeah, we talk, I mean, maybe it's an overused example, but it's in everybody's head about 92 when we yes. were coming out of recession technically, but it didn't help George Bush Sr. at all. Uh, the economy in, was actually, And inversely, 04 and 012, the economy okay. actually, we were saying it isn't really doing that well, but people felt like it was better. 92, it was doing better, but didn't feel like it. So you have both sides of that. Think, I know David's got one more thing to say. We've got I to do. Get a break. Go ahead. I do. Uh, History has not been kind to presidents that try to tell the truth in their first term about these sorts of things. <laughs> this is a second term issue, a second term fight. I agree with Michael completely. It has to happen. But Jimmy Carter's malaise speech, uh, Barack Obama saying now is not the time to go to Las Vegas. Americans, as consumers, do not like being told that they have to cut back. we got to get this thing fixed. Maybe the most honest statement that history is not kind to those who tell the truth. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's kind of an interesting point, uh, David, because if you lose the public, um, you know, it's a different protest movement. I, I but, really don't think they're going to lose the public, though. I think, first of all, to that issue of the China, and it is a, a distinction without a difference that you're right, that police unit sure looks very militaristic in yeah. that sense. But uh, the last thing China needs is another Tiananmen Square photo op at this point. I think uh, that the, I uh, support the Hong Kong protesters. I am always in support of people wanting greater freedom. I have this real pro-freedom bias about me. Well, that's I, weird. Yeah. I think that for our discussion... <laughs> you don't have to apologize. No, not here. Not here, <laughs> right. although although you never know. That's right. <laughs> I will say this, that the um, it is just another reason to have enhanced volatility for, in our standpoint from market observation. Yeah. It's not driving markets. It's not maybe 
even in the top three, but it's just another factor that gives an undercurrent. He published a document, a research paper on GEfraud.com. It's about 175 pages, making allegations that GE has a massive accounting fraud totaling $38 billion, and that it's potentially even bigger than Enron. And there is a big but, though, and that is Marco, uh, Marco Paulus. Sorry, was looking into GE for an unidentified hedge fund. So he's being paid by a hedge fund. So I asked GE specifically about this hedge fund, and they, the spokesperson said that such funds are usually financially motivated, we know this, to attempt to generate short selling, and that's how they can turn a profit. And what is happening today? The stock is dropping, meaning short sellers are benefiting. So take a look at the stock again. We're seeing it down over almost now, even, even down more, down over 12%. Big move in the stock. That's a huge move in the stock. Thanks, huge. Christina, before Thanks. we move on, I know, David, on that last point, Christina was, was making the motivation here. You want to say something, no, right? I think that you have had, uh, I don't ever want to bash short sellers. Sometimes they're shining a light on things that are bad and need to be revealed. But in this case, it is a, a difficulty in our system that you don't need the fundamentals to be true. You don't need the story to be right. Merely saying it creates the result for the short sellers. The fact he's working for an unidentified hedge fund. If someone did this on the long side, yeah. they'd be going to jail. It'd be called inside trading. On the short side, you're allowed to do it. I have a problem with that. Our panel's still with us, Karen, Michael, and David, and um, it's been great to have all of you guys all hour long. So will the economy, David, be something that helps the president, as most people thought it would up until, oh, I don't know, yesterday? No, skip, but, <laughs> but, you know, until recently. But again, here today, even as we're on the air, there go those Treasury yields again. So it depends on your point of view, but the money's fl flowing into U.S. Uh, bonds and these yields are hitting new lows. So what uh, what's it going to look like by 2020? This is the way I would kind of mix the, the political story with what you're asking about the economy. I, I have really shocking news for all of our listeners. 40% of the people in the country are going to support President Trump no matter what the yeah, economy is doing. 40% are Ukraine. not going to no right. matter what. So what? who are yeah, those 20%? It, it is absolutely people that are mostly, as the midterm showed us, turned off by his temperament and Twitter, but turned on by a lot of his policy agenda. He cannot have a declining economy and get reelected. It doesn't have to be a recession, just an economy no, where people don't feel it. It needs to be an asset, not a liability, and he's at risk. I, I actually believe that there are Democrats that I personally could not even stand the idea of them being president that are licking their chops at what they think they see happening in the economy. Stock market volatility, Treasury yields collapsing. The trade war fits into it, the Fed fits into it, but regardless, the point is the narrative will become the economy is not an asset for the president. It'll be very difficult for him to get reelected if that doesn't turn. Right. And I, and I, and I believe it still could, but I don't think it's going to be simple. He's, there's a lot of work that has to be done here. And just to point out what you're seeing on the screen, the day is now turning in that way. Who knows how it goes the rest of the day.